Hey, everybody. Welcome to Away Games, a Chicago Cubs podcast. I'm Kevin McCaffrey. I'm here with Adam Mamawala to talk Cubs and baseball. What's up, Adam? How you doing, man? Oh, I'm great. I'm so good. I, uh, I feel like I've been beat 7-1 by a team that's not <laughs> that good. Uh, personally, that is how I feel. Um, I, don't, I don't feel good about having kind of called it. Uh, I, it's not something that I'm proud of, but as the, as the Cubs were playing particularly well on Monday and scoring in bunches, uh, I did say, you know, this kind of has Cubs getting shut out one nothing tomorrow written all over it. And, uh, you know, they did score one run. They did. did not lose one nothing, but it was kind of that sort of thing where it's like, okay, you score a bunch of runs, and rather than expect that to continue, for some reason in my brain, I'm like, well, this was an anomaly, and they're not going to do that again tomorrow. Yeah, and if you want to see our bummer but accurate predictions in the future, follow us on Twitter at Away Games Pod and Instagram <laughs> at Away Games Pod, uh, where we're tweeting all the time about these games and, and these goings on. And yeah, I think that's the thing we were talking about as we were watching the game on your porch uh, yesterday. That the it seems it seems weird, and you that this team goes so hot and cold offensively and why that is and i think part of it is just that this there's not a there's a lot of similar approaches on this on this uh among this offensive bunch we don't have a zobrist in there really right you know um who used to be a perfect guy to throw in the middle there and sort of break things up in terms of taking his walks being a switch hitter that uh that makes contact puts the ball in play um as far as guys who do that right now it's like hayward is actually looking good offensively and looks like yeah. he's doing it with an approach that is more repeatable. It seems like he's being a little more patient and driving the ball the other way a little more, which is great. Um, but besides him, it's like, you know, Nico Horner is a, con- uh, a contact guy, but it hasn't been super effective contact yet, except for his one great game this week. Um, and it's just like, it's a lot of guys that when they're not clicking at the same time, Man, it's uh, you end up get having uh, an, your d- WRC plus uh, of thirty one with the bases loaded, which I think they had until recently, Ugh. which means they're what sixty nine, not nice percent worse than the <laughs> than the league average with the bases loaded. But yeah, yeah. and they, you know they've hit into some bad luck with the bases loaded as well, and and even this Sunday um, before the big Schwarber home run, like Ian Happ absolutely smoked the ball off the bat. It was just on the ground and right to Tim Anderson. So like. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that, you're not going to get that upset about. But, um, yeah, when the approaches are just bad with the bases loaded or when somebody's up there, bases loaded, nobody out or one out and strikes out or hits the ball on the ground or just doesn't do the sorts of things that a winning baseball team needs to do, it gets kind of frustrating. Yeah. Uh, What was your takeaway from the White Sox series or what were your feelings watching that series beginning then? Um, I mean, I I think as somebody, and I don't know how you feel about this since neither of us – have lived in Illinois for a while. Like I don't really hate the White Sox as much as a lot of Cubs fans seem to. Um, Like I'm much more anti Brewers and and Cardinals and other divisional rivals than I am the White Sox. I think it's a combination of the fact that the White Sox just are better and have gotten a lot better. Um, Better than they were. Yes. No, 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 not better. Yeah. The Cubs are still better. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, But you know, I think they're just a hot team right now. And the power in that lineup is pretty, you know, a guy hitting four home runs in consecutive at bats happens once every what few years. So like if you're running yeah, into a guy bad. who's that hot, it's, it's really tough to know what to do with that. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't feel that discouraged about it. I, I think to be honest, I felt more forlorn during the Cardinal series before they came back in the second game of that double header than I did this past weekend. I was just more willing to chalk it up to like, well, you know, the I think the pitching is going to start to regress to the mean because the starting pitching has been so good. And what that means is that the offense needs to progress to the mean. And mm-hmm. otherwise, we're going to probably have <laughs> more stretches of three and seven baseball than seven and three baseball. Right. And as Ian Happ was talking about on his podcast on the compound, he was saying it felt like Cubs fans wanted to wanted to kill them and stuff. And <laughs> that uh, and his point was basically relax. We're in first place. And that is, like, it sounds like it's, it can be a flip and easy to say thing, but it is real. They're in first place without the offense being anywhere near what it should be. And like you said, the starters have, for the most part, 
But, I mean, the first time or two around the rotation were pitching all out of their minds. And then we've seen, you know, Mills come back to earth a little bit. Um, still had a, had a great game against Detroit this week, going seven. Um, Chatwood, after a really promising first two, has had an extremely not promising next couple with a, an IL stint in between. So you figure if this team, if that's a first place team right now, the offense has to get better even if the pitching gets a little worse and then you still got a first place team is the thing, you know, like these, these wins matter in a shortened season. We're coming up on the trade deadline this week, which is bananas. Um, And there was some stuff on Cubs Twitter. I saw out there this week that was just some some insane takes like, Oh, they need to, they need to sell. Sell what for what for the first thing is is the question. Like, I mean, I guess it comes from uh, meatball fans who are just like, who get frustrated watching these games. And I understand we all get frustrated watching these games, but the solution is not get all the people I see away from me. I want to see new people. That's not, that's not a realistic solution, uh, especially in this season where we just saw the Phillies pick up uh, work, uh, Workman and Embry for basically nothing you're not going to get any real value for selling off guys this year. And you're in first place when second place is a guaranteed playoff spot in a crapshoot of a year where they're still getting given out a World Series trophy. So. Right, and, and like we keep saying, the fact that the Cubs are – they're 18 and 11 right now. They are in first place. And they're in first place despite pretty much all of their offensive guys being worse than you would think they would be, other than Ian Happ. And, yeah. you know, Kipnis, but not, not right. playing every day. So yeah. Yeah. if you just get, like, reasonable production out of the lineup, we're not asking for, you know, Schwarber second half last year just going absolutely nuts. Like, just regular production that you would expect from these guys throughout their career. Yeah. And it's – and uh, I think Bleacher Nation was covering well this week was just how passive the Cubs have been at the plate because – uh, selective is good. You want selective. You want to be waiting to take your pitch that you can do damage to, but you don't want to be taking the pitches you can do damage to. And the Cubs, I believe, uh, in in what they were putting up at Bleacher Nation was uh, that it looked like the Cubs were the Cubs were taking more strikes than anyone in the league, and taking difficult strikes. Yeah, you should do that. But if you're taking the most strikes, you're taking a lot of pitches that you probably could hit. And specifically, Rizzo is taking more pitches than he ever has in his career, which is leading to more strikeouts. And he's hit into some really hard luck, too, lately. But you need him to be hammering the ball a little more, uh, too. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would, you would ideally want his bat to look as good as he personally looked last mm-hmm. night, just with the Derek Dietrich look. The, he had the yeah. Castellanos open jersey. He had the, the – we were talking about it last night, like – do we not see his arms as much as, as we did last night? Because some, he seemed, maybe he was like greased up. Did he have some oil going? He seemed very, very svelte, very lean. Uh, just, he I think we, good. Yeah, you look good. I think we just don't see the arms like that. And I appreciate the swag he came out with, and that swag led to an opposite field single. And then also his worst at bat of the year probably last night. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but the Cubs didn't have many hits uh, against Turnbull last night, and, uh, and Rizzo did have one of them. Um, yeah, I mean, lineup-wise, who's who, who are we feeling good about right now? It's like, obviously, Ian Happ, I think, is coming into his own as a borderline star and someone who I feel like is the guy I want to see at leadoff for this team. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you feel good about Happ. You feel good about Hayward of late. Um, mm-hmm. You, you got to feel better about Javi after maybe the worst stretch that we've seen oh my since, God. like, 2014. It's, it was just completely just out of sync at the plate. Yes, you could. I wish you could have bet money on that. It'll be three pitches and him going to sit down because uh, it seems like it was that for a week and a half straight. And he even talked about it being like, I don't know what's going on. I, you know, I'm trying to do well. And it's like, of course, that's the case. Um, and it seems like he's made an adjustment a little bit to just commit to waiting on the ball a little bit and going the opposite way a little more. Mm-hmm. Um, and already, yeah, like you say, he looks leaps and bounds better than he did four days ago. So that's really encouraging. I think you have faith that Rizzo will be there. Um, and Wilson control- obviously has really struggled. Yeah. He's, Wilson has been hitting the ball so hard and nothing's happening. He's also been striking out a lot and not taking his walks as much as he usually does. Um, so hopefully his home run yesterday helps get him going a little bit. Kipnis is still putting together quality at bats. Um, you know, you don't expect him to OPS a thousand plus the whole year. 
So it's, you know, I think you're just, you're seeing a lot of guys who just are maybe on the way to normal in this lineup, you know, but not, uh, not a lot of guys who are quite there yet. And I mean, Bodie has been solid too. I mean, David Bodie is someone mm-hmm. who, especially in clutch situations, is, he's had the hits that matter in that Cardinal series, especially. So. Yeah. yeah well, wh- one thing that Len mentioned, um, I think over the weekend that I thought was kind of interesting in relation to Javi and, and I believe Wilson as well is like, you know, clearly these guys are able to <laughs> be pretty energetic regardless of the circumstances. But Javi particularly is somebody who really feeds off of the energy of the crowd. And yeah. I think playing in front of no crowd this year has to affect him in some way because he's so engaged with that at all times playing at Wrigley and even on the road. I mean, he really is somebody who who plays to the fans and enjoys that element of it. So I think as as much as it helps for the Cubs dugout to be loud, it's not the same as forty thousand people chanting your name. Yeah, and when and and I mean, being a showman is a part of it for Javi, and yep. I love that it is. You know, and it's it's that's one of those adjustments that you just can't really statistically look at. We don't know how it's affecting everybody, really. You know, to to just have this weirdness that there's an element that must that just is not going to feel like real major league in baseball in the way that you know it always has to them so uh yeah so i think we're we're just hopeful more of these guys start to come around i do want to hear what uh our friend ken schultz uh facebook messaged us yesterday and basically like was asking about hitting coaches what is it exactly you say you do here, you know? (laughs) And I think that is a good question. And I mean it in not even a hater way. Sincerely, I would like to know what Anthony Iaposi's approach is uh, in a specific way. Because uh, we're looking at a team of everyone regressing except for like maybe two, three guys to this point and it's a small maybe stop of. looking at pictures of the first place you played baseball because you keep playing <laughs> like someone who just started playing baseball <laughs> that is a very good point and we have the, he does a thing that's it that's it's it's a lovely idea where ever you think about where you fell in love with baseball and show you show a physical picture of that and then everyone has reverted to that form of themselves uh <laughs> at the plate which is not i mean by all means bring uh you know Ziploc bags of orange slices for everybody after the game, but absolutely, yeah, yeah, g- g- stay healthy. But uh, yeah, I, I do, I would like to know what the approach is because it seems to be just uh, too. I mean, the main problem here seems to be too patient, but also we're seeing guys when they do take cuts at balls in the zone, so many fouled off meatballs, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like to use meatballs in two ways. I know. I'm a real the. I, I have a real. Uh, versatility of language with me, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one thing that's kind of frustrating and we don't want to belabor it because we've certainly mentioned it before is like Nick Castellanos would look pretty nice in this lineup. And you talk about what I is trying to do in terms of like, Hey, remember why it is that you love this game. Mm -hmm. Well, who was Mr. Opening day every day last year? Yeah. And would just look perfectly as a, I mean, if the Cubs could use anything, it would be a right-handed bat in this lineup too. Uh, when you think about the guys who are hitting well, it's all lefties for the most part. And uh, it, yeah, a right-handed bat who makes contact at the level that, and quality of contact at the level that Castellanos does, would be the perfect guy to add to this lineup. And Cincinnati has him. And, it, uh, and it's, that, that is a case where the front office and the player were all in on a reunion. Yeah. And it was ownership not wanting to not green lighting that money this is out of all the possible free agents the cubs could have signed i think in the really in the theo jed era this is the one most distinctly that we know about that the front office wanted to do and were told no uh so that's you know that's yeah just, and there, there are other situations like you know not re-signing arietta i think in retrospect looks like the right move probably considering and, how he's looked for the phillies yeah and because they also signed darvish at the time right. too so at least that was a choice and in investing money somewhere and does look like absolutely the right thing because uh, we've talked about the hitters but pitching wise the news this week the biggest news is that darvish continues to be the darvish of the second half i think is the biggest news um, he's taking an extraordinary amount of time in between pitches, 
but it is legal and that is helping him uh, decide, uh, uh, you know, it, with his gigantic portfolio of different pitches. And you, there's really no starting pitcher in the National League you'd rather have than present day you Darvish. No. Well, I mean, it doesn't make sense that he needs that much time. It's like, uh, did you see that, that like TikTok trend where it was people pretending they were like choosing which character they would be in a video game? I yeah. imagine that's how you Darvish picks his pitches. He's just like swiping through like 17 different <laughs> options of like, all right, what, what specific type of cutter do I want to throw? Yeah, ab- absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and he's been playing like it's a video game too. It's been so fun to watch that. Uh, that win uh, that he started against the White Sox and really mowed down that lineup outside of Abreu's one incredible sort of chop swing that went 460 feet. Uh, Darvish is just, I mean, he's, he's pitching perfectly right now. And that's, uh, that, you know, we, we, were, we were, and reasonably so, I think both all in on that Hendricks is your opening day starter this year. He's earned it, all that stuff. But going into a playoff series right now, Darvish is your number one. And I yeah. love that. Darvish and Hendricks. And that's the thing, too. Uh, to the other use of meatball, bad fans who are like, <laughs> sell. Ooh, I got mad over one frustrating weekend. Burn it all down. Uh, this, If you have Darvish and Hendricks starting two of your games in a crap shoot of a playoff year, you got a real chance. Um, even if you have the, you know, the regression uh, that we've seen in Leicester a little bit and it's sort of instability of the Chatwood spot. Um, and I guess starting pitcher-wise, we saw Quintana come back last night too. So that's a thing to talk about. And that was kind of a confusing outing because there were elements of, of his outing last night that looked very encouraging. And then ultimately, if you look at his stat line and what the result was, it's not going to be too pretty. Three plus innings and three runs is not what you're looking for uh no. it's not and he, I saw, i'm not great at math but that sounds a lot like a nine era <laughs> it does it's a uh, very similar to one and he uh, obviously saw a couple of those runs were runners that he left on that were then scored after he he was in there but um quintana was I, I saw him quoted after the game saying that he does want to start and then also that he just wants to help the team so two slightly at odds quotes but both both fine you know to neither is an upsetting quote to hear yeah but i think what we saw yesterday is it, it confirms for me what i think i want to see here which is quintana in the bullpen um, I would rather, I, because, I mean, we saw him, and it gets its first start back after being off, so that's fine. You expect a guy to sort of tire out a little more quickly than, uh, than he might otherwise. But he looked really sharp in the first two innings. Mm-hmm. And then he got uh, smacked around after that. And his velocity on the fastball was 93 yeah. in the first two innings, and then it was down to 90, 91 by the third. So if he's losing that that quickly I think the solution is this could be a really effective two inning reliever for the Cubs this year right especially when Kyle Ryan is the only other lefty that you have in that bullpen yeah exactly I I think I just think he fills more of a need there when in terms of a starting rotation spot Chatwood like Quintana was coming off uh, an injury so I think it's hard to really hold that start that start uh against him too much but I think Chatwood gets one more start you know I think you I think you give him one more start maybe and then it's got to it's got to come back Uh, otherwise you got to move on but to your point I think what what Q would bring to the bullpen um versus what Chatwood would bring to the bullpen is much more valuable because we already have uh who who you uh, have stated to be the same exact person to Para and Sadler I've Um, I've never seen them in the same room (laughs) I yeah (laughs) I like them both I like him in both of his forms yeah Yeah. but I mean they're both fairly hard throwing righties who get strikeouts who have a lot of movement on their pitches and that's kind of what Chatwood is not to be too simplistic about it obviously Chatwood um, you know, brings a little more to the table than I think either of them do. But the point is to have Quintana as an extra um, lefty bullpen arm when you really don't have anyone else. Obviously, uh, Brad Wick is not in the picture this year. So, um, yeah, and I, I think I don't know that much about – I feel like I, I weirdly haven't heard Quintana talk that much in three and a half years. But yeah. um, I, I, he seems to me like a good teammate and somebody who would, like, take on that role and not be, like, you know – yeah, upset about I, it. Uh, I, maybe, maybe he would be, but I don't know. 
No, I think I think so. And I think you, you, you know, in terms of a guy coming in from the left side, if you have uh, a lineup that's going to be one one time through the lineup, mostly lefties or the first six or seven hitters, you if you have mostly lefties, he could really be a weapon that way. And then also, if you get in a situation with one of these with one of your non Darvish, <clears throat> non Darvish, non Hendrick starters, who even if they're effective, might go short. I think. Yeah. This is he's Quintana's the perfect guy to bring in in the if in the fourth or fifth inning in a game that you are leading mm-hmm. and is close. So I would like to see them keep Quintana in the bullpen, even if it's not Chatwood in the yeah. rotation. Because if Chatwood's next start also doesn't, if Chatwood's next start is like either of his last two, uh, then I think you just have to put Alzali back in his spot. Uh, right and I'll, yeah, Alzali looked looked very good, and um, yeah, to to that point, like I think the plan probably will be another piggyback outing. I mean, uh, you know, a la uh, Mike Mike Montgomery and Eddie Butler when they were kind of doing mm-hmm. that that sort of setup for a while. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I think Chat would maybe gets one more start, and then if he is taken out after the second inning, then they they reevaluate. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think Alzali certainly I, – I imagine he would be slotted in for this coming weekend um, against Cincinnati, right? With the, the doubleheader double yeah. <clears throat> double coming up. Now, there is an – you know, there's an off day Thursday, too, which helps a little bit before a doubleheader. Also, one thing I saw Tommy Hadovy talk about is that they are considering a six-man rotation, which, hmm. okay, but for me – that's going to be a no for me, dog, because we, like, I, I think – uh, I, I just don't think in this shortened season it makes sense mm-hmm. to do that. I'd rather piggyback your guys and get your two dominant guys out there more often. Exactly. Give yeah. give me Hendricks and Darvish 40% of the games, not 33%. Yes, exactly. And then, I am good at math. <laughs> you, you are good at math. We're pretty good at math podcast, I think, overall. Um, but, yeah, and then I think with, if you feel like you have a surplus of starters, which maybe you felt like in the beginning of the year but not as much now, then I think you use that by just piggybacking a, a couple of them. You know, you give mm-hmm. uh, Alzali and Quintana as one starter can give you most of the innings in a game, flip the lineup righty to lefty and, uh, and be very effective that way. Um, yeah. So where you compare Quintana with Mills or, or yeah, or Chatwood, really any of those right. um, I'd prefer. Let me, let me, uh, let me throw this at you. Yeah. Craig Kimbrell discuss. Discuss. I am very encouraged. Um, we saw him have a couple of really good starts, one in, in, uh, in a couple, or in, not starts, but you know what I mean, a couple of really good appearances. Um, the velocity touching 99, but mostly 98, 97, which is up and good. We're seeing some swings at the curveball, and uh, he got two quick outs against the White Sox. Previously, he had been starring in a movie, uh, movie called Absolutely No Trouble with the Curve. Yes, absolutely no trouble whatsoever with the curve. Spitting on the curve, a totally different movie. Um, <laughs> also yeah. starring Justin Timberlake, of course. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think very encouraged by Kimbrell right now and very encouraged by the usage of him. The fact that he's been I – think, I think David Ross has been very good with this bullpen. Um, and I think the way that he's – Worked, uh, worked Kimbrel back into high leverage situations, but not necessarily closing yet, I think has been perfect. Yeah, I, I think I still feel better about Jeffress uh, or Wick. De- I would say definitely Jeffress, but like Jeffress or Wick over Kimbrel right now. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting how much, I, I think early on in the season, I was kind of of the mindset of like, maybe Kimbrel is just like a lost cause at this point, and he's just not going to be able to contribute to this team. So it has to feel good for him to be able to still be put in meaningful games um, or, you know, meaningful spots in these games. And also you hate to see the walk ahead of a I, I don't even remember. Was it, I don't know. What's their lineup? Like I forget who he walked. Um, before well, is, you on Sunday. Was it Tim, Ander, uh, Tim Anderson, Moncada is usually Anderson yeah. leading off. Right Either now. way, the idea right, is yeah. that, you know, when, when you're up by one run, you absolutely do not walk the person ahead of literally the hottest hitter in the world in that yes. moment. But once you've already done that, um, I don't, I didn't hate him kind of nibbling with Abreu because I'd rather a walk there than another 460 foot bomb that puts the White Sox ahead. So right. I'm sure it was frustrating for him to be taken out. You and I were talking about how, 
you know, maybe Ross could have left him in to, to try to wiggle his way out of that. But I can only imagine we, we know what Cubs Twitter is like if they, if he leaves <laughs> Kimberl in there and then he gives up a home run or a hit or a walk or anything other than getting out of it. Um, the second guessing would be just ridiculous. Yeah. And, and I mean, Jeffress uh, just eats base runners for dinner, you know, like he's the just, king of getting very, very stressful, hard lineouts to center to escape <laughs> jams. Yes. And he, I, I think Jeffress has earned, uh, coming in in that position, which is rough on him, but he's been so good at it. And in that White Sox game, he basically should have gotten two saves. He comes in at the end of the eighth, ends that jam, then gets himself into sort of a jam yeah. in the ninth, and then gets Moncada to ground out after David Bodie falls down trying to catch what should have been a game-ending pop-up. Oh, man. Yeah, maybe maybe he's most comfortable doing that. Maybe he needed to make it stressful on himself to, to get out of it. Hey man, I, and it's it, it is great to have a reliever that doesn't mind getting stressed out. And uh, I love, I just love Jeffress's whole demeanor, the uh, the the K strut with the the pumping of the right knee coming up, yeah. almost like he's leading a band, like leading a marching band around the uh, around the mound is great. Uh, we're talking about he's got a little Chris Rock pacing the stage to him, that sort yeah. of aggressive tiger like. Uh, stuff. It's yeah. Jeffress has just been so fun to to have and so crucial uh, in this in this bullpen. So I mean, you know, you can see. I think as we approach the weird trade deadline, which who knows what's going to happen um, mm -hmm. he here, like you can see the makings of a playoff threat here. You know, the Cubs are not as good as the Dodgers, and they're not as good as the Yankees. They're not as good as, uh, you know, a, a, a few teams that, they're not, as, that they'd have to go through. But you don't always have to be as good in the, in the playoffs, you know? No, and also considering the very bizarre playoff format, there is a world in which the Dodgers get screwed and just get upset in that first round. And if the Absolutely. Cubs make it through the first round, you know, I don't think the Marlins are going <laughs> to beat the Dodgers in the first round. But right. if it's that short of a series, you don't know. Yeah, exactly. And you, you're starting to see enough bullpen pieces come together and uh, enough starters that when you shorten up the roster like you do mm -hmm. in the playoffs, it could be dangerous, you know? Like there's, it, like you said, it would be nice to have a real good lefty reliever in there because you've got a, a few guys from the right side that you trust coming into games. Tapera looks just great, you know, and Sadler. Yeah. Sadler, I think, could be something. Wick, uh, Jeffress, obviously. But um, – yeah, and you shorten up that starting rotation, and it gets, and you get two guys that are really nasty, and uh, it, it, you know it's encouraging. At the trade deadline, the team's in first. You know, it's uh, it's good. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. It feels like the season just began because it did in some ways, but yeah. the season still ends the same time it would usually end, and the Cubs are still up. I guess what three games? Yeah, heading into Labor Day weekend, or is Labor Day weekend this coming weekend? Either way, heading into September. Right. Yes. Yeah, heading into September. Um, so not that the Cubs haven't been in that position the last two years and it didn't work out that well, but uh, hopefully the, hopefully the Brewers don't win every game in September. And also, even if they do, there are more teams making the playoffs. So right. it would, it's possible and I don't want to jinx it, but like for the Cubs to completely miss the playoffs at this point, they would have to play really, really, really badly for the would, last month of this season. Yes. Uh, so I think, I think you got to feel like you're in, in a good spot there uh, going into going into Cincinnati this upcoming weekend. And I would like to, uh, it would be fun to light up Trevor Bauer. He have the suspicious spin rate that he calls out everyone else on and no one seems to make him give an answer on yeah. um, in terms of some substance he's almost surely using, uh, which would be his words. Uh, so it would be nice to see the Cubs uh, beat up that D bag this weekend, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then we're looking at the trade deadline coming up right after that. So it could should be an exciting week. Yeah, we've got we've got one more in Detroit tonight. I think I I don't know about you. I feel good about uh, Lester versus Fulmer. I, you never know what to expect out of out of this team or out of a Tigers pitcher at any given moment. But mm. um, yeah, I think the the Cubs should should win tonight, and then you've got four in Cincinnati. Um, possibly one in Pittsburgh before we talk the next time. But mm. yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm trying not to panic. I'm, yeah. I'm going to try to listen to Ian Happ. I'm succeeding at not panicking currently. Uh, so that's, so that's nice about this, about everything else in life, fairly panicked, but uh, <laughs> about the Cubs. Yeah, I think that's fine. 
The only national baseball news I think to, to get to, we've got uh, Giolito threw a no-hitter last night. That's fun. Good for him. Um, you know, he seems like a cool guy, and that's, and, and that's fine. Um, yeah. Nice play by, uh, by Adam Engel in the outfield to, at the end of that game, too. That uh, ball was ripped. Scary off the bat. Yeah, very, yeah. very nice job by Engel, who's a really, really good defender out there. It looks outfield. like he uh, read his positioning card. Yeah, yes, his big old positioning card uh, put him in the right place there. Um, so that that was fun. Less fun, uh, Tom Brenneman's a dipshit, and uh, he, I'm sure most people know he used a homophobic slur in the booth really, really casually, you know, <laughs> like really yeah. just casually and in public around other people. He didn't know that the mic was on, but apparently he just talks like that um so but it's my understanding that he's a man of faith right yeah yeah he's a man yeah he's a man of faith like that means fucking anything to just say (laughs) anyone can say that i'm a man of faith now what you know like it means fucking nothing it it, what do what means things are your actions what you what you actually say and do and what we know uh about tom brenneman that way uh is bad <laughs> you know and I shout mean, out shout out to our to our buddy uh big stick nick for just hitting a bomb during tom brenneman's attempt i will say i will stress attempt at an apology that was sure. atrocious that even if someone hits a home run during your apology fucking commit to the apology you can get <laughs> to the home run later what are you doing people are seeing the home run you have video and audio you're not a you're not a radio guy there too um yeah just a strange situation where everyone knew he said this and then he was just calling the game like it didn't happen for a while um and then got canned also i would like to say uh in terms of how players respond to this kind of thing amir garrett posted after the game uh that he you know that he stands with the lgbt Q community and uh, everything you'd expect from Amir Garrett, who just seems like a super cool guy. Also, hard throwing lefty reliever and a cool dude who I I would I want him on the Cubs at some point. I love that dude. Um, and then Trevor Bauer after the game was posting about how he wasn't allowed to wear the shoes he wanted, his free Joe Kelly shoes, and didn't address the what everyone was uh, was rightfully talking about after the game so just just a reminder that trevor bauer is a dipshit don't be fooled by uh i'm accessible he's a dipshit uh and it uh we saw so that was i think a very good example of how two different players react to to a situation like this and uh our friend ken schultz at ken schultz underscore follow him on twitter uh as i've said before but the best writer i know writing about baseball and Ken wrote uh, a piece about this in, uh, I think, for Outsports that uh, was great and funny and very logical. Um, so, you know, just follow Ken Schultz and read his stuff generally. Yeah, Ken, Ken is fantastic. And he, his writing is such that um, he always manages to balance the gravitas of the moment with humor that is both like cutting and poignant and is uh, there's a reason for it and yes. um he's he's fantastic he was uh, he was on tv he he did an interview on uh, on fox new york which mm-hmm. uh, he <laughs> i think he made a joke about like all it took was me moving back to chicago to get my uh, you know new york tv credit so <laughs> yeah. you, you love to see it but uh, he he was just as eloquent and and uh composed as, as you might <laughs> expect in uh, in commenting on on thom brenneman being a fucking dick Yes. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Perfectly done. Uh, so yeah, follow at Ken Schultz underscore read that stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's all. That's all I got. How about and, you? Uh, I think that's mostly all I got. If you want to do any prop bets on who the next announcer to get fired is, just kidding. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that's an option. But if Ooh. you want to do some interesting prop bets, there are a lot of sports going on at the same time. Frankly, this is a unique moment in time that hopefully never happens again. But for mm-hmm. there to be the the kinds of sports happening right now that are, when is there ever going to be a time that the end of the baseball season coincides with the NHL and NBA playoffs and the beginning of the NFL season? Right, so, it's in, in the most insane and dense time in sporting history in some ways. Right. So if you are somebody who likes sports and you want to make some interesting uh, bets, check out our friends Thrive Fantasy, at Thrive Fantasy, um, and use promo code AWAYGAMES, all one word, uh, for a free $20 credit when you deposit $20 or more. And have some yeah. fun. 
Thrive Fantasy. Away Games is the code. Go get you some free money. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Follow us on Twitter at Away Games Pod. Same thing on Instagram at Away Games Pod. And we'll come at you next week, next Wednesday on Away Games.